Hello, this is Karen Launchbaugh at the University of Idaho, and we've been talking about rangelands of the world, and now we're going to focus a bit more on rangelands of the U.S., and we're going to start up in the Pacific, in the Pacific Northwest, and the Great Basin. Here we go. The rangeland ecosystems that we're going to look um, at are actually subsets of larger biomes, and this is just a, a, pair, um, a diagram of biomes of the West, and you can see that the um, middle of the country is grasslands and savannas. We'll talk about those after this presentation. We'll also talk about deserts and semi-desert regions. But today we're going to focus on that Mediterranean area on the far west and also the desert and semi-arid desert um, that is the light tan, which is the cold desert. We'll talk about these um, biomes um, by climatic region because climate in terms of precipitation and temperature are really what determines the plant type and the biomass that's able to grow in a region and therefore these are the large categories in which uh, different ecosystems of rangeland are found. Again today we're going to talk about the Mediterranean region in the far west, the Pacific Northwest, and then we'll move down to the Great Basin. The regions that we're going to talk about are based on a map by Kukler which was made in the 50s and 60s, and he traveled across the West, talked to people, looked at pictures, and was able to categorize most of the Western uh, types of vegetation. Now, this is a actually a fairly um, stylized or simplified version of Kukler's map, um, but we're going to simplify it even further because I just want to um, emphasize focusing on just a few ecosystems. So here's a simplified map um, that we're going to use. Again, highly simplified. We're going to start today on the annual grasslands, the oak woodlands, the sagebrush steppe, the intermountain grasslands, and the salt desert shrub. So still kind of complicated, but simplified. Okay, let's start in the Mediterranean. The most distinctive feature of the Mediterranean is that Mediterranean climate, which means that there's dry summers. So look at this um, climate diagram on the right, June, July, August, September, very low precipitation and uh, fairly warm temperatures in the summer, so kind of warm and dry in the summer and cool and wet in the winter. Um, this diagram is from uh, uh, Sacramento, California, and it's pretty good. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good listing. Remember, these temperatures are averages, so although it says it gets to 90 in the summer, it can often get hotter than that. So Mediterranean climate, wet winters, warm, dry summers. Specifically, we'll look at the annual grasslands here, and that's that sort of area in the Central Valley um, that has a long history of livestock grazing in the region, and now, of course, is a lot of farmland also. So the annual grasslands, let's talk about what those grasses we're talking, we're going to look at in this presentation. Um, certainly, cheatgrass and medusa head are the two dominant grasses that we might find in this region, and then here's a couple of pictures of what those grasslands might look like. Um, these regions were once dominated by needle grasses. Um, they're all they're mostly annual grasslands now, but um, they were large, mostly needle grasses, purple needle grass, for example. But that warm and uh, that Mediterranean climate with those warm, dry uh, summers and those cool, wet winters were really well suited for annual plants that came from other parts of the globe, such as cheatgrass and medusa head. And it was kind of a an accident of events that those annual grasslands. Came to a climate they were well suited for and then we had the introduction at about the same time in the late 1800s of really heavy grazing that occurred for um, the, to support the miners during the gold rush and also in western development people that were moving and starting to put down homesteads uh, from the oregon and the california trail so there was heavy pressure with lots of cattle and there was were some plants that were really well suited to that kind of heavy grazing, and so the land was quickly converted from perennial bunch grasses to annual plants. Today, there's more than half of the region that is farmed, and it farms that really rich land that we, that is central California, and many of the crops that we eat in the winter in our um, grocery stores come from this region. There's an interesting feature of the annual grasslands in California, and that, that is the occurrence of vernal pools. Now, vernal pools are these shallow pools that are formed in the spring, vernal meaning spring, and they're unique because they're home to lots of rare and endemic animals and plants, amphibians and rare plants. 
And the other thing that's interesting about these vernal pools is they're actually benefited by livestock grazing. Usually we think of grazing as being something that is not compatible with rare animals and plants, but in this case it is. So here's a story from the University of California in Merced about the relationship between livestock grazing and vernal pools. Earlier, cattle were often grazed at levels that could not be supported by the ecosystem or the grasslands where they're, they're found. So now cattle actually are important and they're crucial for our management. Cattle graze down the invasive European grasses that now clothe the grasslands. And these invasive non-native plants, these grasses, they've really been here for decades and decades. And it's been found that the cattle, through their grazing, where we have vernal pools, will graze down that grass and allow the native herbaceous flowers to grow and flourish. The cows are a net benefit and that their grazing is, is good, especially for maintaining uh, the vernal pools. Mm -hmm. Now, we need to manage the cows, so we have to make certain that we have enough cows, but not too many. So that's part of my job and others at the university is to make certain that the cattle grazing is done in a way that doesn't harm the environment and gives the cattle grazing uh, and the rancher what he needs uh, to make a good productive you know, cost benefit from the cows. One thing we pay attention to is, is the number of cows, uh, the time period that they're in the grasslands, in the reserve foraging, and we also pay attention to where they forage. And if we need to, we may be making modifications that uh, may change the grazing regime to make certain that the vernal pools stay in uh, great shape and great health. We play an important role in providing management and oversight on the grasslands that are under our stewardship uh, and working closely with the rancher to, to make sure that we have uh, you know, the good number of cows that are satisfying all parties. Some of the plants and animals that you might find in the annual grass sun might include cheatgrass. The annual grasses, cheatgrass and medusa head, would be real common. Remember that those plants came into areas that were once historically bunch grass, such as purple needle grass. And, uh, the, and those annual grasses kind of overtook the perennial grasses. Uh, it's hard to pick an iconic animal from this ecosystem, but certainly it would be common to see deer and it is a very important cattle producing country area. So cattle are there. And as we mentioned earlier, also for maintaining the endangered plants and animals. Also wouldn't be uncommon to see a hawk like a red tailed hawk overhead. Let's move next to the oak woodlands. Oak woodlands, um, of course, are characterized by oak trees. And we're gonna look at two regions. One just above the annual grasslands, you would find a band of oak in the Pacific climate, but you also see oaks throughout the middle of Texas. Central Texas has a live oak region, and both of them have kind of similar physiognomies, and they're, they both have oak because they're pretty moderate climates. They have kind of wet and warm winters and, and, and summers that have some moisture also. Here's some pictures of those oak woodlands that you might see. The central one in the middle is, um, is from Texas, so live oak trees in Texas, and then the upper two are from California, but they're both live oaks on the very little bit on, in the understory. So there's several kinds of live oaks, some um, from oak savannas to gamble oak woodlands, shinnery oak shrublands, live oak woodlands, all the same dominated by different species of oaks and different understories. What unites them all is this moderate climate. It does depend on the region, but especially kind of warm, wet winters are important. There's an understory of grass, especially in some areas that are true savannas, strong understory of grass with a break between that grass and the, the canopy, which would describe a savanna. They're important for wildlife habitat, especially because oak trees do have acorns, and acorns um, are important sources for energy for wildlife in the winter they have. Uh, they do have some tannins in them, but they also have fat in them or oils, which are good energy sources. Fire is important um, in the savanna types where it will go along the base and it'll maintain that herbaceous grassland under the trees and, and, and stop new seedlings from coming in so that you have that overstory of oak and the understory of grass. Oak woodlands, the kinds of animals and plants you might see, of course, oak, called li live oak trees. I've got two pictures of live oaks there. They're evergreen. Uh, their individual leaves don't last 
all the time, but they always have some green leaves on some, on them. So that's why they're called live oaks. Understory might in California, especially might be something like cheatgrass, um, that understory grass, that invasive grass. What kind of animals might you see in the oak woodlands? Uh, you might not expect to see rattlesnakes, but they're actually quite common in the oak woodlands. Coyotes wandering through, and, and I've also pictured uh, California quail here because they would be important in the oak woodlands of California. Okay, now let's move to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it isn't a Mediterranean climate that it has these wet winters and moderate summers. So the difference between this and the California annual grasslands and those California Mediterranean is that it's not quite as warm in the winter. It's, I mean, sorry, it's not quite as warm in the summer, but it's still wet in the winter and a little cooler in the winter too, but still a Mediterranean climate. We're gonna look at a few ecosystems in this Pacific Northwest area. Uh, we'll start with the Intermountain grasslands. That, now they're really intermixed ecosystems. They include the prairie grasslands and the canyon grasslands, but also we would characterize some mountain grassland types as in the Intermountain grassland. The thing they all have in common is they're just um, very fertile areas that have are characterized by bunch grasses. Let's take a look at some of those. Intermountain bunch grass. Uh, would include the Palouse Prairie uh, on the left there and the canyon grasslands in the middle. Of course, many of these regions, if they're not topographically um, difficult, become a farmland. And so in the bottom, we have the Palouse Prairie that has been converted to farmland. The plants that would be dominant of the Intermountain Bunch Grass are Blue Bunch Wheat Grass, Idaho Fescue. Some of the regions we've already talked about would be the Palouse Prairie, the canyon grasslands. Again, these ecoregions are all um, characterized by blue bunch wheatgrass, Idaho fescue. Camas prairie would be another one that we might put in this group. They're all characterized by late summer, um, by uh, winter rains. And so then the, the rains in the summer are pretty uncommon. And the outcome of that is that there's lightning is also uncommon in late summer. So wildfire was historically not a really big part of this ecosystem. Usually when we think of grasslands, we think of wildfire as being really important to control the shrubs. In this case, it's really just the long, dry summers that have created a situation where it's really difficult for shrubs and trees to become established. So although there aren't, there isn't a lot of lightning ignited fires in the late summer, those trees and shrubs don't invade in as easily into these ecosystems because of the long, dry summers. Again, I mentioned the Palouse because it's a really unique area in eastern Washington and western Idaho that is created by um, lussel soils, soils that are windblown. And the windblown texture of soils is usually a silt, which is great for farming. So because of these wonderful soils that were under the prairie, very little of this prairie exists today. I'd say it's one of the most endangered ecosystems on earth where just about 1% of its original prairie exists today in just what we call prairie remnants. Some plants you might see in the bunch grass, I mentioned blue bunch wheatgrass, Idaho fescue, the dominant um, bunch grasses. A tall larkspur we talked about is one of the most endangered, or one of the most dangerous poisonous plants in the West. It kills more livestock than any other uh, plant. It would be common in the intermountain bunch grass region, especially at higher elevations. Western yarrow is common throughout North America, but especially common in the intermountain bunch grass. What kind of animals might you see? Certainly would see elk, especially in those mountain, higher mountain bunch grass types. Chuckers uh, would be common in that, those canyon grasslands. And don't forget that wolves were introduced into those northern regions and into the northern bunch grass type. Let's move next to the Great Basin. Now it's still in that uh, Pacific type climate, but much different now. It's The winters are not quite as um, uh, as moist and, because it's in a semi-arid climate and the summers are not quite as dry. So there's really some precipitation possible any, throughout the year. But look at those levels in Salt Lake City, uh, very uncommon to have three inches of precip in a month. Two in Reno or one inch in Nevada and any one month would be would be uncommon. The temperatures are higher here than, than we saw in California or in the Pacific Northwest also. So hotter summers, um, a little bit of moisture every year, but m overall much less moisture. Let's talk about the sagebrush steppe. First, it's a semi-arid region, precipitation from 8 to 20 inches. Summers are warm and relatively dry. 
and it's you can see it's quite extensive. Here's some examples of sagebrush steppe. Uh, it's called steppe because steppe is a grassland, so it's a mix of sagebrush and grassland. Uh, quite a few different examples here. We'll talk about juniper invasion. We'll talk about some iconic animals such as the pronghorn. And this, I'm going to talk mostly about big sagebrush. There are a number of species of sagebrush. Big is the most common one, and the fire being important in this ecosystem. As I mentioned, it is one of the most extensive range types in Western North America. It is mostly publicly owned, so the land is owned by largely the BLM, some Forest Service and state lands, so mostly owned by public, some private lands, especially down in the waterways. Fire is interesting in this ecosystem because it kills sagebrush. So here's, a, here's an ecosystem that's dominated by sagebrush, and yet fire is very important for maintaining it, and yet fire is deadly to sagebrush, most sagebrush species anyways. So how does that work? Well, it has to do with the uh, temporal and spatial scales of fire. Historically, fire would have been patchy in small patches. Once the area was burned, then perennial grasslands would have come in and it would have been a grassland area. The shrubs would have started to grow up in the grasslands and pretty soon, well, in a number of years, a, few, a decade or so, you'd have start to have an ecosystem that was dominated again by shrubs. And then you might have fire again, which would turn into the grasslands, and then the shrubs would start to take over. And you have the cycle of grasslands, shrublands, fire, um, just happening on the ecosystem in, in relatively small patches, not millions of acres. Um, a couple things have changed over time, however, though. We don't have those that kind of historic fire regime. At low elevations, we had the annual the invasion of annual grasses, such as cheatgrass, which happened in the early part of the 1900s. That really changed the fire regime because these annual grasslands are very um, good fuel. They um, create a, a dense and continuous bed in the understory of these shrubs. They also dry up earlier in the summer, which means that they extend the fire season. So they're easily ignited and they're extending the fire season. So what we have are more frequent fires uh, through every few years. We can have a fire on, a, on an ecosystem that's dominated by inv invasive grasses. And when fire is that frequent, the perennial grasslands, the perennial grasses just can't be reestablished and outcompete those annual grasslands. And the shrublands certainly can't handle being just going back to seed every few years. So what happens over time is with those very frequent fires, you have an ecosystem that only annual grasses can survive in. And we have that throughout much of the Great Basin. Interestingly, at slightly higher elevations, when we're when the sagebrush is right up against the, that juniper line. Then we have juniper invasion that becomes a problem because there's not enough fire. So as uh, humans started to, um, as, as uh, European Americans started to um, develop and homestead in the Great Basin, they uh, historically stopped fires. So juniper invasion started coming down the in elevation when fire frequency was decreased. So the bottom line is in one part of this ecosystem at the low elevation, Fire is too frequent and it's fueled by annual grasses. A higher elevation, fire is not frequent enough in most of the management, um, which we'll talk about later. It, a lot of the management involves reestablishing fire. Some plants that we might find in the sagebrush steppe or sagebrush grassland ecosystem, of course, big blue stem, or I'm sorry, big sagebrush. Many different kinds of sagebrush, but big sagebrush is the one that's really iconic in this uh, eco region. Blue bunch wheatgrass uh, would be in the understory. Some invasive plants like spotted knapweed uh, would be common, or in some areas. And then, of course, I mentioned already this role of increasing cheatgrass in the understory. Many animals are iconic and 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 um, are obligates to this ecosystem. Uh, one interesting animal um, is pronghorn. They are common throughout the sagebrush steppe, and they have an ability to digest sagebrush that scientists don't really understand. That for some reason, the terpenes in sagebrush, they're able to deal with those. Um, sage grouse are, they actually rely on sagebrush. So even though we learned earlier in class that sagebrush has these essential oils and terpenes, uh, sage grouse are, are able to use those and, and use them for energy, especially in the winter. So sage grouse are one example of a plant that of, of an animal that is an obligate to this ecoregion. It requires sagebrush in its life cycle. I put in feral horse here because throughout the Great Basin, that's where we have the greatest population of feral horses. 
they have an uh, intricate relationship also with sagebrush um, in, in this ecoregion. Now let's stay in the Great Basin and let's go a little lower in the elevation in a little drier areas, three to 10 inches, uh, where the soils are, are really mostly aerosols, not much organic matter. And, and the plants that survive here are really adapted to dry and salty conditions. I've put another map here uh, to show you uh, just kind of a little bit more about where those low ecoregions are of salt desert. Uh, they, they're kind of in these bands throughout the ecosystem. Here's some pictures of the salt desert. On the left, we have a picture of shad scale. In the middle is an area that was is dominated by greasewood. So those would be two plants that we would expect to see in the salt desert. When you think about the basin and range of the Great Basin, you think of an, an area where there's sort of a high elevation and then you move down to uh, uh, sagebrush kind of bench lands. And then in the range down in the low part, you get to salt desert shrub. And it's in the lower part of the landscape because it accumulates salts. When, when rain um, precipitation occurs at the higher elevations, it mobilizes salt in the ecosystem, sodium chloride, the kind of salt like table salt, but also potassium and magnesium compounds that salts that move down through the ecosystem and then accumulate in the basin. So you have big basins like, like the Great Salt Lake, which is in the salt, salt, salty region, low in the landscape, accumulates salts. When plants come in, they have to be really adapted to these salty soils because plants, uh, soils high in salts are, are, uh, make it so that the water that's in the soil is not as available to plants. But some plants uh, have the characteristics that allow them to deal with that salt. And many of the shrubs in this ecosystem have characteristics that help them deal with salt and they're often members of the Kenopodiaceae. Uh, an example is, is shadscale salt brush. It, um, it, it's, sequesters the salt and actually puts it on its leaf. So if you ever see a plant, you could pick it up and, and taste it and it actually tastes salty because it just sequesters that salt in its leaves. Um, and these shrubs, like most shrubs, are nutritious in the winter because they're alive. So they're really important for wildlife and livestock winter forage. So this region um, historically was used by sheep and cattle and also wildlife as winter forage. One of the greatest challenges in this ecoregion is that fire was not a frequent player in developing the ecosystem because there's a lot of space between plants and fires weren't able to create that bed of fuel that would allow it. I mean, fires weren't able to move across the landscape because there wasn't a bed of fuel that allowed it to move across the landscape. But with the um, invasion of annual plants, these exotic annuals like cheatgrass and red brome, uh, that, that creates a fuel that is continuous across the landscape and has created fire and most of these shrubs in the salt desert shrub are not adapted to fire. So much like we had in the salt in the sagebrush steppe, a similar situation in the salt desert that there's an increased fire frequency and that creates problems for these shrubs. I've got an interesting story about one of these kinopodes and that is halogeton. Uh, this is early on um, in the 40s I think, 40s and 50s, uh, throughout the Great Basin there was uh, a growing amount in an introduction of this halogeton. And the problem with halogeton, as you can see from the middle picture, is that it is deadly to sheep if they are introduced to it, into it in the in wrong condition. For example, if they're thirsty, they don't have enough water in their system and they eat a lot of it, it'll kill them. And uh, this, these plant, these uh, sh sheep in this picture, uh, it wasn't common, but there were several situations where hundreds or thousands of sheep would be killed because um, they would come in, they'd be traveling down to the lower elevations and they'd come across halogeton, eat too much of it. It has an oxalate in it, which um, creates a situation where the sheep cannot uh, mobilize oxygen in their system. So the oxalates made it so they simply died quite rapidly. Uh, what's interesting about this is the sheep men got together and said, there's got to be a solution for this. So they worked with the Congress and the legislative legislatures in their states and they got together and they created the poisonous plants lab and some uh the halogeton act just like the um endangered species act there's a halogeton control act and they looked for solutions and one of the interesting solutions was um planting crested wheatgrass on the landscape because crested wheatgrass is really competitive and it outcompeted the halogeton 
So this is an interesting situation because they took a plant as a biocontrol against a plant. But much of what we know about invasive plants started from trying to understand um, halogen, and, uh, and it helped us get some tools to deal with this poisonous plant. And today you rarely hear of many animals dying of halogen, much less common in the landscape and certainly large patches of it uh, that would kill animals it is not common. People know what to do uh, and they've been able to control it. So it's a, a success story. Now we talked about the low elevation being the salt desert, those um, bench lands being the sagebrush, and now as you go up a little bit higher, you'd find pinyon juniper woodlands at that mid elevation. Of course, above the pinyon juniper woodlands would be fir forests and, and other kinds of true forests. But the pinyon juniper woodlands are at that mid elevation and they are expanding uh, um, as fire was reduced. So when, when we reduced the fire frequency, they expanded into the shrublands below below them. So let's take a look at some of those juniper, uh, pinyon juniper woodlands. Pinyon juniper woodlands have quite a few different forms and they vary from being dominated by pinyon pine to mostly junipers and sort of everywhere in between. So many forms uh, from all the way from Utah, I'm from Idaho down into Nevada and into Utah and their expansion was um, allow, I mean they've, they're expanding because there's been a reduced fire frequency at these elevations. Um, mostly due to human fire suppression. And as the concern over fire increases, uh, there's oftentimes more co um, combating of fire and that creates situations for woodland junipers to expand even further into sagebrush step. On the other hand, it's a tool, uh, um, prescribed fire is a tool that humans are using to try to keep the pinyon juniper woodlands in check and allow sagebrush to persist. Juniper invasion is one of the larger uh, concerns uh, in the upper part of the sagebrush steppe and the lower part of the juniper area. The juniper, pinyon juniper pines start to invade into the sagebrush. It's such a concern that managers and scientists have tried to separate out what types of control and ecology occur on a sear from early invasion to complete dominance of juniper. So you can see here in what's called phase one, that is early in the succession when juniper is moving into uh, the, the the sagebrush step, and plants are still small. The dominant species is still sagebrush here, and at this point there are quite a few things that managers can do to set back that the juniper invasion. Of course, this would be a point where if fires came through, it would reestablish a grassland and would really move those. Uh, junipers back up to higher elevation in craggy areas where fire was not, you know, did not go through. You could also use herbicides. There are a few herbicides that are available and then uh, individual um, removal is possible in phase one. When you get to phase two, the juniper gets much more dense. It's taller. There's a lot of structural diversity from higher to lower plants. There's a lot less understory and starting to happen in phase two. So the use of fires is difficult because of fuel buildup. So when fuel buildup starts to occur, in this case fuel being the juniper, then catastrophic fires can be quite um, common because uh, the juniper just will burn very hot and it can be very dangerous. When you get to uh, phase three, that's a, an ecosystem that is completely dominated by the pinyon juniper type. And there's very little understory, uh, very little sagebrush in the understory and then erosion becomes a problem because there's not much holding the soil down. So you'll have this coalescing of rills and very high erosion rate when you get to phase three. The loss of understory and the seed bank can also lead to weed dominance in this ecosystem. And the greatest, um, the weed of greatest concern would be red brome and it really creates wildfire risk um, once you get to an area where those annuals start to move in. So Juniper invasion occurs over kind of a long sear and uh, a lot of management options in phase one and not hardly any in phase three. So that's uh, some of the main ecosystems of the Pacific and Great Basin region.